I'm in the cellar. I want to talk about some wine and and give you some information. So here we go. I had a couple wines sent in over the holidays uh, from an associate that um, I, I recently became acquainted with in the Oregon Wine Board. Uh, she was kind enough to arrange a couple samples to be sent my way for enjoyment and, and discussion, so I thought I'd share them. Uh, so one of the things, though, before I get into that is I want to talk a little bit about Oregon and Oregon wines. I've been there a few times, been through the Willamette Valley, been to some of the other regions in Southern uh, Oregon, and um, it's really one of my favorite places for, for sourcing wine, for tasting wine. Uh, I use Oregon wines on a lot of my wine lists. Um, most of the wines that we're going to encounter are basically going to be coming from the Willamette Valley. This is an area that's sort of, um, you know, it kind of starts south of Portland. It's on the western side of Oregon, on the western side of the Cascades, kind of scrunched in. It's a true, huge, wide, long, uh, broad valley um, that is uh, nesting between the Cascades and the coastal ranges for the most part. There's a few gaps that allow cool air to come in from the Pacific Ocean and uh, you know, some of the features of this of this area is there's a lot of volcanic soils, but there's also um, historically been a lot of flooding that has left a lot of, uh, of, of deep deposits. One of the things from uh, driving into the Willamette Valley, one of the first times that I noticed was you, you have this sort of really flat land, and then all of a sudden you have these bumps of hills and, and, uh, and ridges and whatnot that kind of come up uh, out of this sort of almost like ocean of flat land. Um, particularly in the southern part and central part, and and that's what we're going to kind of talk about a little bit actually. Um, and and it's so cool because there's all this agriculture. It's really sort of flat, and you could tell that that flat land resulted from um, just just repetitive flooding that happened, uh, you know, after the last ice ages and whatnot. But it um, it it is uh, interspersed with these sort of bumps and hills and and and, uh, and and ridge lines that kind of come up out of it. And that's where a lot of the key growing regions are for, for some of my favorite wines, uh, particularly with Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So let's talk about these two wines. Two wines that came in, uh, one's a Chardonnay and one's a Pinot Noir. Um, the Chardonnay is actually from a winery named Lingua Franca. I'll put some, uh, some information up along with this post so you know exactly what it is and a picture of the label and whatnot. But uh, Lingua Franca winery really kind of started about 2012 to 2015. Um, owned initially and, and still in partnership with Larry Stone, um, one of America's great wine personalities, uh, Master Sommelier and uh, a gentleman who worked for number of top restaurants before kind of settling here in uh, in Oregon to, to make wine a little bit more full-time. I've met Larry a couple times. I carry some of his wines on the list that I work with and uh, really, really enjoy his style. Partnered with uh, a couple of gentlemen who are, um, one's kind of a financial guy, I think, and then one is uh, sort of like one of the most famous uh, Burgundian wine personalities they are, Dominique Lafonce. So Dominique Lafon is somebody who has made wine and makes wine in central Burgundy. And for the most part, I say, um, you know, what I encounter is white wine from, from Dominique Lafon, from, from both, um, you know, uh, key regions in the Cote de Bone and also down in the Macon. I, I carry some of the wines that he touches there. But uh, he came to work with, uh, with Larry Stone in Oregon and Lingua Franca. So let's get this bad boy open. This is the 2017 Lingua Franca Estate Chardonnay from Eola Amity Hills. And, and when I was talking a few minutes ago about the, you know, the geography of the Willamette Valley, the whole Eola Hills um, really kind of exemplify, I think, what I was talking about. These are, these are hills that, that come up off of the valley floor um, with beautiful sort of um, rolling and, and, and sort of uh, flowing if you will, hills that uh, aren't too high, but, you know, have uh, exposures um, for the vineyards heading in a, in a, you know, in all regions, but the key vineyard areas are heading sort of east, south, and they sort of wrap around the hills facing a little bit southwest. And they're also close enough to what's known as the Van Duzer Corridor, which is an area that um, splits the, the coastal mountains or hillsides a little bit and allows for these cool coastal region, uh, coastal winds to come in and cool these vineyards. So really key for making um, sort of elegant, more or less acid-driven wine, sort of like Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, which is what the Willamette Valley is famous for. All right, so tasting through this beautiful artwork, by the way, um, this wine, and, and like I said, I'll put up a post, uh, but beautiful artwork here, and on the label, 
we find that it's listed at 12% alcohol, which is perfect for somebody like me who's old and can't handle a lot of alcohol. Um, but this is their estate Chardonnay, shallow volcanic soils found in the vineyard. State Chardonnay is beautiful floral middle to mineral tones. Let's check that out. Yeah, right off the bat. I mean, it's it's elegant. It's um, It's got this sort of like uh, balanced perfume floral. I would say, yes, you've got some orange blossom um, and uh, lemon and a little bit of citrus. But underlying that, you have this sort of well-integrated um, sort of vanilla and toast and, and oak flavors that, um, you know, I, I sort of read the bio on this wine a little bit. So I know it's been um, aged in a combination of a couple different types of oak, but just a subtle use of oak comes through in the nose a little bit, but that balances against that beautiful um, sort of citrusy and, and apple pear and, and, uh, and that blossom kind of character in the nose. Yeah, real pretty. A little spice tone to it. So a little bit of that sort of baked French baking spice too. On the palate, not heavy. This is not a California weighty style Chardonnay, Chardonnay that, that some people get used to. If it's seen a lot of oak or it's kind of sweetened up a little bit, this is balanced. It's got acidity. It's got freshness. Um, it's got lift. It floats across your palate. It leaves your palate dry, but there's a little bit of a sleekness or a slickness to the wine that is just pretty. Um, this is a great, this would be great with food. My mouth's got a little bit of saliva going on, uh, kind of watery. Um, again, a little bit more of those well-integrated, elegant oak flavors, but not something that's overwhelming. This is balanced, ethereal type wine. This is really pretty, really elegant wine. Um, absolutely delicious. I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be excited to drink this later on. So Lingua Franca Estate Chardonnay um, from the Willamette Valley, specifically Eola Amity Hills. 2017. I'll put some notes up on the on the site below uh, with this posting so you have a, a full context of that. All right, moving on. The next one is Pinot Noir, um, a grape variety that, uh, if you know me, is um, kind of one of my favorites. Um, and this comes from a winery that I have never actually seen or worked with, um, but doing a little bit of background research, uh, started about the same time as Lingua Franca, 2011-2012. Coming at it, though, from a different approach. The ownership comes from the IT world rather than, um, uh, uh, you know, long-standing wine personalities like Larry Stone and, and Dominique Lafond. Um, so the family here came from Vancouver, found, uh, uh, found their vineyard uh, about 2011. Um, small vineyard, though. It's only about seven or eight acres, I believe. And they planted, uh, they started planting Pinot Noir, a little bit of Chardonnay. Um, so tiny production here. Um, this is... Uh, Cremoisi, uh, I hope I'm saying that correctly, Cremoisi, uh, which I believe means crimson in French. And uh, it, uh, it's the Sophia's Block Estate Grown Dundee Hills, Oregon Pinot Noir 2017. So what, what that all deciphers out to is um, Dundee Hills is another sub-appellation within the Willamette Valley. Um, it is a little bit farther north than the Eola Hills, and it is, um, as the name implies, it's again Dundee Hills. So we've got these hills that rise up off the valley floor a little bit. I think there's a little bit higher elevation here. Um, but this is kind of the area that, that some of the old guard um, from, from the earliest days in the 60s and 70s, um, um, when the initial, the first winemakers came and planted uh, fruit in Oregon, they settled in. And uh, so pretty, uh, pretty cool neighborhood um, with some classic names. But these guys have only been around since 2011, 2012. This particular production, about 175 cases, so not a lot of wine made. Happy to have a bottle out of that. And uh, uh, let's give this one a try. All right. All right, pretty color, as you might expect from Pinot Noir. Let's just check the label real quick. I always like to see what's going on here. So Jory Soils, 175 cases, 100% uh, Dijon clone. So 667 clone Dijon um, and and just bursting out of the glass with aromas. Uh, 14.5%, 14.4% alcohol listed on the label here. So a little bit higher in alcohol than our Chardonnay and, and a little bit on the high end, I think, for Pinot Noir um, in my experience. But but real pretty color. Um, yeah, totally ruby. You can see through it. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's just super elegant, glossy, you know, the light jumping out of the glass. And... Uh, and looks inviting. On the nose, holy cow. 
cherries, raspberries. There's a little bit of spice, kind of what I would call a slight briar spice or like that raspberry prickle, raspberry thorn spice um, that you get from, from, from raspberries in the middle of the summer when they're baking in the summer sun. Um, a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of earth tone to it, a little bit of like, uh, you know, red, red earth, red, red, uh, red, uh, clay kind of earth, um, which, uh, or almost like a, like a, you know, the, the type of smell you get, like uh, some people would say it's mineral like, but it's what I kind of experience when I'm thinking about, um, volcanic type soils. Um, even though these are jewelry soils, there's certainly an underlying bedrock of basalt here and it's gotta be mixed in a little bit. So, kind of cool combination of this earth and, and fruit. And as it sort of opens up in the glass, you get a great explosion, really elegant nose. A little bit of floral. Um, there's definitely like a, a, a spice kind of, um, a spicy red blossom kind of aromatic to it as well. So if you're working on your uh, WSET studies or something, you know, you get a lot of, a lot of keywords there for your, for your descriptor. So let's taste it. Yeah, super smooth. I don't know what the oak treatment was. They didn't put a lot of descriptions on their website, but I do taste a little bit of wood. Um, I'm kind of sensing a, a little bit of a, of, a, of a stem factor, not stem flavors, but of a tightness, a grippiness, and, and it comes from the tannin and the mouthfeel that I think results from the fact that there was probably some stems, some, some probably some whole cluster kind of... Um, uh, 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 handling of the grapes here to let them macerate a little bit and 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 extract some some um, both color and fruit flavors, but also a little bit of stem perhaps um, uh, before fermentation, and then uh, just an elegant, beautiful, pretty mouthfeel. Um, again, good acidity. My mouth's watering. It's juicy. There's a there's a glycerous kind of quality to it, but not overly rich or fat. It's smooth. It's it's a lot like the the Chardonnay in the fact that it just kind of glides across your palate. Um, leaves you with good acidity, but this lingering, you know, really ripe, fresh, fresh raspberry kind of flavor. Um, this is a wine that I definitely like to eat with food. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to be super, um, balanced against say, uh, salmon, poultry, you know, hearty vegetarian dishes, things like that are going to, are going to work really well with this because it's not going to overpower them. It's got great fruit to kind of complement those flavors, acidity to uplift and balance against them. Um, but not so much tannin or, or intense flavors that it's going to overwhelm them. Certainly no sugar or anything. It's a dry wine. Um, alcohol, even though it's a little high at 14 and a half percent, I get a little bit of that kind of coming through. That might be the one slight complaint, but I don't think it outweighs the wine. I don't think it makes it unbalanced. Um, so, so I'm not really worried about that. If, if, if I were actually going to pair this or suggest pairing on a, on a dish, uh, say standing table side with a guest, I would probably pair this with a filet or some type of meat, um, because I think you need something that's going to have a little bit more substance to balance against that alcohol. So an elegant piece of meat, something with a little bit of a, of a, of a earthy sauce or a rich sauce, um, might work well, but not so much that it's going to overwhelm it. So, um, a nice kind of uh, lean cut of beef, like a, like a filet might work really well. Yeah, a lot of ripe summer type raspberry and and uh, and and uh, briariness almost coming out of the nose. Just keeps evolving. Slight undertone of earthiness. Not mushroom, but just a little bit of earthy, fresh mushroom, I say. And just a touch of cinnamon spice, and then uh, there's just ripe raspberry. So good, well balanced wine. Um, really pleasant to drink, and uh, and and two nice products here that I really appreciate the Oregon Wine Board sending to me. So um, there you go. A couple good wines. Hopefully you enjoyed the breakdown. Um, maybe learned something. I will post some information along with all of the labels and everything in the post below, so that you know where to get them and support Oregon. They make great wine there. Really appreciate the folks out there, and uh, hope they keep making great wine. Cheers.